And we're recording and we're laughing because I've just had a false start. So welcome. I'm Chris Grimes. This is the Good Listening To Show here on UK Health Radio. And also it's part of a broader uh, podcast as well called the Good Listening To Podcast. And I'm very, very excited today to welcome to the Good Listening To Show clearing a very lovely, warm, kind, awesome human being, Colin McGill. So Colin, welcome to the Good Listening To Show clearing. Hurrah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Good morning. Lovely to be here. Lovely to have you here. And I've been very excited researching you as well because you've got a particular um, energy to you where one of the conversations we had recently uh, was where you said you're at the most exciting or excited time of your life. We're going to come on to some Shakespeare later on and the seven (laughs) ages of man and that sort of inspiration. But I'm really intrigued to talk to you about your sort of secrets to a a passionate and engaged longevity of, of connection to purpose which is what you're all about so you are the md of turbo change which is about um being an international business growth facilitator uh, you were really warmly recommended to me by a mutual friend of ours called dave stewart who's also featured as my first program here on uk health radio yeah. um but I, i've been really struck in the connection of just how um warmly disposed towards really really deeply helping people you are and indeed we'll, we'll talk about this you've been a great specific help to me too uh, during the pandemic and i know one of your business uh, sort of missions is to help people recover from what a lot of people experience where things went off a cliff at the beginning of the pandemic so this is the show where i'm going to take you through the normal structure where we're, we're going to welcome you to a clearing then there'll be a tree within your clearing then we'll shake your tree to see which storytelling apples fall out that's where the five four three two one comes in then there's some alchemy some gold some shakespeare and a cake so it's absolutely all to play for colin mcgill <laughs> so let's get you talking um how's morale i see you're sitting in your caravan there you're the first guest by the way to be speaking to me from a caravan so get you (laughs) so what's your story of the day how's morale it's very good actually it's very good i'm sitting in 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 my caravan in south Ayrshire. Uh, i'm looking out over uh killeen castle to my left turnby lighthouse to the middle um ilza craig which is a a big sort of a a, a big mini mountain in the middle of the the ocean and um and and are into my right and and, and the beach of 50 yards in front of me. So it is the most wonderful place to be. The weather's not great, mind you. It's been, it was gorgeous yesterday, but it's a bit, a bit rainy this morning and blowy. So um, yeah, this is our weekend, a weekend retreat. Lovely. And tell me the name of the lighthouse again. I've always liked lighthouses. So what's the name of your lighthouse? It, 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 it's Turnberry. It's the, the, the Turnberry Golf Course. Yeah, the famous, the famous Trump, Trump Turnberry Golf Course. So, One of my yeah. favourite children's books by the way was the lighthouse keepers lunch did you ever see that book i, I didn't know i didn't <laughs> and by the way that's something you should buy for your grandchildren i, I was on your facebook by the way researching you as well and there's, <laughs> there's some lovely posts about happy birthday to this wee maniac and this wee monkey so you've obviously got somebody very important to you who's just been six yeah yeah, yeah. My, my, my grandson aaron he's a, he's a great wee guy he's, he's just turned six um he had, he's losing teeth left right and center so he's very very gumsy and he's wired he's wired to the moon um, I love that little, losing. Yeah, a little maniac, as his, his dad calls him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I like that losing teeth, right, left, and centre. That sounds like they've all gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I love your accent. And as we know, the the um, the Celtic or the Scottish accent is always really pleasing on the English ear. And in helping me grow and develop, you know, my own business, Second Curve, and, and even helping me with what I'm doing in, in the podcast space, I was really, really struck. Something that really hooked me was you asking me a particular question several times, but in your wonderful dulcet tones, you would keep saying to me, so what? So what? <laughs> So what? And so I think of you as Captain So what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. You, the, your first two guests have been Scots. That's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, both Dave and, Dave and myself. <laughs> well, there's something about the great outdoors of Scotland that I'm really, really obviously, you know, seduced by. I just love it whenever I get the chance to get up there. So you, you, yeah. you sound like a perfectly situated caravan as well in Ayrshire, you said, didn't you? Great part. Yep, yeah, Ayrshire. Just a bit, it's about 50 miles from Glasgow, south of Glasgow. You're bang, and, bang on. And if uh, the first question is a deliberately clunky one, if a, if a fellow human being, as we all experience, sidles up to you and they're a stranger to you and they suddenly turn and say, oh, hello, uh, what do you do? Uh, it's a really clunky question. I know that. But what, what do you do, Colin McGill? Um, I suppose if, if I talk professionally, what, what do I do? I, I help. I, I get very frustrated over 
people and organizations um, slow pace and adapting and responding to what's happening in the world and, um, and, and the reluctance to, to make change happen. You know, change is the only, the only constant that we have in our lives. You know, there's a you know, change, death and taxes. Um, so, you know, change, <laughs> you know and, and, and actually the, the pace of change over the pandemic period is probably accelerated sort of 10 times in, in, many, in many areas. So I get frustrated when I see the slow pace that, that people and businesses move at in terms of getting, making change happen. So, so my, my mission is to help as many folk create the environment that allows them to be to achieve what they want to achieve in their lives and to help business achieve what they want to achieve in their business lives as well. So this is really to help businesses accelerate the pace that they, they remove the speed bumps. Every, yes. We all have speed bumps in our lives that slow us down. We do find then something crops up and slows us down. It could be attitudinal, it could be a whole bunch of things. And the same is true of businesses. So basically, we, we I'm, I'm all about, myself and my small team is all about helping um, businesses understand the speed bumps that are holding them back from getting where they want to get to and, and flattening them over. And, and I love um, your use of speed, by the way, even in your LinkedIn banner profile, uh -huh. because it's called yeah. Turbo Change. You've got a lovely, yeah. um, there's a really iconic image of, of speeding towards a light, which is about recovery, <laughs> I would assume. It is, absolutely right. Towards yeah. clarity. Yeah. A big mantra is, is is speed breeds success, and you think about you think about the the vaccine rollout. You know, uh, we, we were on our knees with the, the with the, with the virus and, until the vaccines came on the scene, and all of a sudden, the incredible speed that the UK in particular yes. uh, you know, has, has gone with, uh, and it's it's just transformed the whole the, you know the whole situation. So I think it's probably the best example I can think of that that speed actually brings you incredible success. Yes. So that, that's what drives me as a you know as a as a person and you know and as a business person and energy is like a precious pot of golden honey it's the elixir of all connection and i i have noticed i have experienced yes. you know because i apply the same currency of using a lot of energy to get where i'm trying to get yes. to i've really enjoyed how you absolutely resonate and chime back with that you have a thank tremendous you. energy in what you bring thank you so much also Appreciate there's you. been that lovely um spin on the darwinian quote that i've enjoyed over the course of the pandemic and of course everyone knew that it was um the survive the, the survival of the species isn't necessarily the fittest it's yeah. the most flexible yeah. and adaptive yes. and i think yeah. that's what you you have really helped me even though i knew that to realize that one needs to be flexible yeah. and adaptive to change thank you sir. thank you yes that's really important isn't it vitally important so I'll invite you to talk about Turbo Change later, uh, Turbo yeah. Change Limited explicitly. But what right. I'd really love to do, uh, Colin McGill, as my gift to you for your moment in the sunshine, we're going to welcome you to a place called The Clearing, where all good questions come to be asked uh, and all good stories come to be told. So let's get going with the storytelling metaphors on The Good Listening To Show. So Colin McGill, it may or may not be the great outdoors, we'll find out. But where and what is a clearing like to you, literally or metaphorically? <laughs> Um, yeah, so literally, uh, a clearing for me is some place that, I mean, I'm very fortunate being, being here, I can walk 100 yards to the beach, um, or at home I can walk 200 yards and I'm out and just complete an absolute countryside. And, and actually, I find myself, particularly during lockdown, um, you know, I've been through a massive transformation because the, the, the business was not structured for this new world that we're now in. So I spend vast amounts of time restructuring the whole organization, how we do things. And and there's so many times, you know, people talk about, you know, writers talk about writer's block, but they just, you know, you see, you see pictures in, you know, in, 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 um, on television where the, there's a big pile of, of crumpled up paper in, in, in the waste paper bin. And I find myself getting into this sort of thinking and mental block so many times. I just go for a walk. And literally 200 yards from it is a lovely lane along something called you know, the Fairy Glen and down in, in among the fields and past the sheep and what have you. Lovely. And I, I found myself having that simple walk. And it was it was like, you know, you turn your phone on, you know, when it's been asleep and it goes ping, 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 and lots of things fly in. But for me, what happens is lots of things go ping, 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 ping. Lots of ideas just flow into my head and, oh, I hadn't thought of that. I could do that. I could do that. And after a half hour walk, I go back and I've, I fixed it. <laughs> I oh, spent and... days trying to fix it, you know, thinking about it, but just not thinking about it, letting the, the brain relax. I just a flow and the countryside does that for me. One of my favourite Nietzsche quotes, by the way, is the best ideas happen outdoors, linked yes. to another quote that I got from our mutual friend, Dave Stewart, which is, if in doubt, walk it out. And That's great. 
And by the way, I experienced you ringing me on a walk when I really, really had hit a metaphorical window. I felt like a sort of majestic swallow that had just gone twonk through. I was in an, I was in a, a major slump. And you happened to ring me when I was almost like a, a sort of fish on the hook trying to sort of slip off, if you remember. Not because I, I was trying to avoid you, but I was just in a really... So do you want to tell me a bit about that? Because that was, that was just an extraordinary instinct you had. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, yeah, it, 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 I've done that a few times. And I've phoned people and they said, you know, funny you should ring. I, I, it's funny how often I've heard the term funny you should ring. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, is the, I don't know. It's just, I, I can't explain it. Just sometimes it tells me, you no, know, it's maybe, I, I just maybe, it's maybe the, 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 the email communications or sometimes it's the lack of communications and you say, somebody's not quite right here. I can't put my finger on it, but something's not quite right here. So, I just think I'll pick up the phone and have a chat. And I, yeah, By the way, what that tells me, that. what that tells me deliciously is what a great, um, well, a great human being you are, but what a great father and what a great uh, partner you must be because you just have this instinct to know when it's time to talk. I wouldn't go that far. You know, I, I, <laughs> you weren't going I to take that I'm, compliment. No, 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 no I, I, I can't take that one. I think I'm probably far, far more instinctive and far more attuned professionally than I am as a as a husband and, and father because I can do massively better in both of these areas. <laughs> I like the fact I tried to blow a bit of extra smoke at you but you weren't but having I, it. <laughs> I'm not taking it that at all yeah. <laughs> I love that you've just sort of sort of coughed the smoke back at me. <laughs> But anyway, so we're in your lovely clearing, which is the outdoor. So be specific yep. because it's your clearing and I'm going to arrive with a tree. So which specific part of that lovely scape you've just described would you like me, with your permission, to arrive with the tree? Um, there's the end of this thing called the Fairy, Fairy Glen, uh, where there's a, a lovely, a lovely clearing. And you, you walk over a bridge over a stream. And actually, probably just stopping at that stream would be just lovely. There's a wee bridge. And, uh, and and it's a, a small, more of a you know a babbling brook uh, running running below it, and uh, it, it's surrounded by trees, and you can you can see some sheep, and sometimes there's a couple of horses in the field and what have you. It's a lovely it's a lovely spot, and yeah, that's a, it's a great spot for me. I love that. That is a clearing, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. right there. So if I may, by the way, for an extra million points, no cash attached. What's the name of the bridge, please? I can tell you, no idea. <laughs> It's small and wooden. <laughs> Everyone's a winner, but you actually lost that particular point. But anyway, if, if I may, we're arriving now in that gorgeous it's babbling actually, book. No, actually, it's called Collins Bridge. I've just, I've just named it all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you also think fast too. I like that. So here we are at Collins Bridge near a babbling brook. Yep. And that's a beautiful yep. clearing. Thank you for positioning yep. that. OK, arriving now with a tree in your clearing and we can use one of the actual trees you can see if you like. We're going to shake your tree to see which metaphorical yep. storytelling apples fall out. And this is the 54321 exercise yep. where you've had five minutes uh, or as long as you've needed before we, we are doing this conversation to have thought about four things that have shaped you, Colin McGill, three things that inspire you, two things that never fail to grab your attention, which is the hot oh, squirrels uh, moment <laughs> borrowed from the film up, if anyone remembers that. And then a quirky or unusual fact about you we couldn't possibly know until you tell us. So it's your sh tree to shake, but don't panic. You haven't got to shake it in a wanna. Just crunch those apples as deliciously as you like in the order in which you like. Over to you. OK, um, there's two that were very experiential and had a big sort of formative part in my development as, as a probably as a human being uh and certainly as a you know as a, a young adult uh one was and I, I can still remember i can still experience all the the emotions uh, i can i can still picture myself doing this probably i was maybe 14 or 15 years of age and i was in the scouts and i was a, a second in the in in, in, the, in my particular uh, patrol so you had a, a patrol leader uh, and, and this was a unit of maybe six or seven, seven guys. I was second. I was second in command. I was the, you know, they called me the second. And I remember I had to give some tuition to a young troop member uh, to help him move towards a badge he was working towards. And we'd arranged to do this on, I think it was a Wednesday evening. And there was a, you know, I lived at the time fairly close to Hamden Park, you know, the Scottish uh, football football park. And there was, a, there was a, a Scottish match on that, that on the Wednesday night. And I quite fancied going to that. 
And I was talking to the young guy, and the young guy said, "Look, I probably can't make it on the you know, on the Wednesday." So I just decided that, well, he's not going to be there, so I wouldn't bother you know you going to the, the scout hall as well. And thinking, you know, as a fourteen year old, that was the, that was entirely fine. The week after, I went to the usual scout meeting, and I was asked in by the, the, the by the, the scout leader, and and basically he he demoted me for not holding up to my responsibilities. I said, but you know, the, the, the young chap wasn't going to be there. And uh, so I didn't see the point come on. He, say, he says, it is not the point. It's not the point. You made a commitment to be here. Yeah. And in life, honoring your commitments is very important. It's a very important part of the values that we try to you know, imbue within people uh, in, in the scouting, the scouting movement. And I remember sitting there, you know, he, he had this um, Union Jack sitting over the, over, the, over the table. And I found myself, you know, picking away at the corner of the Union Jack. I remember saying, you know, talking about me almost in the third person, you know, sitting there, you know, playing at the Union Jack. And and he says, I, I, I'm going to, you know, demote you back into into the pack. And, and at the time, probably thinking about now, I've just thought about since, you know, since you asked me these four, four questions, I thought about, was that was that harsh? It probably was, um, you know, for, for a first offence. Um, but actually, it had a had a massive impact on me as a as a person at that time, and I guess it taught me that you you have to honour your commitments. Yeah, and I guess I've lived by that my entire life, probably annoyingly so. You know, my wife will say we, we have to do so and so. I say, well, we did say we'd go. Now I can't say that I always do it. There's some things I say I don't really do that. I just, I just don't yes. do it. But but some t- but but I you know I always say look no I've said I'll be there but I, but. What you, why do we have to? So I said I'd be there. It could be a business thing. It could be, you know, the bad weather. And I see this often in things like weather. You know, I've got to be in, in Manchester for, you know, for um, I'm running a session for, for a company. And the weather is, is dire and there's no guarantee that I'll get there. And I'll say, but I said I'd be there. But the weather's terrible. I said, I know it is, but I said I'd be there. Yes. <laughs> and I, I find myself fighting through all kinds of horrible weather. To, I remember recently, you know, to, a couple of years ago, you know, having to get, you know, a, a, a taxi to, to, to Carlisle to catch a train to Manchester, things like that. Luckily, it's paid for by the train train company, but it's things like that. It's just it's just embedded this, you know. If I said I'll do it, I'll do it. Yes, um, I love that. And it, yeah, and it, it's it, it's almost, yeah, it's just it's, it's pretty it's a pretty intense part of who of who I am, and I think it's quite an important part of. It's really profound life. how somebody in our lives can say one thing at a particular formative time in our lives that we uh, never forget. Exactly uh, right. And do you remember his name even, the, the scout leader, yeah. or was it just experience? Mr. Stewart. Wow. Lovely, lo- lovely man. Lovely man. Uh, I think, I think, but he taught me a viable life lesson. Yes. Um, you know, and whether semantics, whether, uh, you know, we, we, we say it was the right thing to do or not, whether it was a bit tough or not, and that maybe a, a milder way of, of giving me a lesson, but actually it would not have been as profound. Yes. So I, I thank him. I thank him for that, for that experience and thank him for the, giving me that, um, you know, massive, massive legacy. Yes. Wonderfully articulately put. Lovely. Next. Uh, next one is um, probably in my, I remember when I was 25, I, I was, uh, I, I was, I was in sales and I was, um, my home was Glasgow. My my folks had moved up to Arbroath, up in up near Aber, in, uh, near Aberdeen, just north of Dundee, and I was living and working in in Carlisle. I had met my now wife, um, and I was travelling. I was travelling over the whole north of England, you know, with the, in this company that I was that I was a salesperson for, and I I, I was living. I was sleeping in, you know, on on friends' uh, couches and uh, I, was, I, was, I was bunking up with a friend of mine who had a flat down there as well and then that fell through and I moved to another place and I was travelling up to you know, Glasgow at the weekend to see you know, my, my, my girlfriend at the time and then up to see my parents up, up in, up in Arbroath and, and doing masses of travelling. And, and I came down, I just, one day I just felt really, really bad. You know, not physically, I just felt mentally, I just felt I can't cope with this anymore. And I came down with something they called nervous exhaustion. Uh-huh. And basically, just so many things flying around, and I was 25 at the time, and and this affected me for probably what maybe four or five months. And I then had probably a few years later, I, I had a um, an issue around stress manifesting itself, almost uh, thoughts having a heart attack, but it's purely stress. And so I think probably over that maybe five year period, um, you know, I, I went through 
some you know, probably mental health challenges, I guess. Uh, if I'm looking back now, see, that's probably what it was. But actually, since then, I've been incredibly robust, yeah, incredibly resilient. And, and actually, you know, pretty much nothing, nothing gets my way. OK, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I worry about things occasionally and and things will concern me. And um, I've stopped having sleepless nights. I used to have a lot of sleepless nights. I stopped having them anymore. I've, I guess I've learned to to manage to manage my mind to a much better degree than I did in that in that that time. But I think what that did was it 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 taught me it made me much more resilient. I think that experience at a fairly early stage, if you like, um, you know, it's taught you know made me you know very resilient, you know, men mentally, mentally and physically. And and um, yeah, so that's a that's again it was a very profound stage of my life that I remember you know in great detail and and not with a lot of passion, I have to say. <laughs> And and it's very relatable because at any one point, apparently one in three people are suffering some sort of form of mental yeah. anxiety or, or yeah. you know, panic attacks or just yeah. some trials and tribulations to their mental well-being. And very yeah. relatable because ironically, you know, me too, I can relate to it. But I, I remember not 25, 42, I'm 58 yeah. now, yeah. but 42 was what I call my year of the wibble when I just right. had a real wobbly wibble. But uh -huh. it's very, very profound and formative. It happened you know, at a really sort yeah. of ripe age of 25 when you knew you had to make some, yeah. some significant changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then the, the, there's a couple of things that just, you know, they, they just kind of evolved and happened over the time and, and actually became sort of, you know, core, you know, core beliefs and core values um, that, that, drove, that drove my life. And actually, they, they drive everything I do professionally. And it was around, you know, I've, I've always been a great believer. In fact, I was talking to one of my clients yesterday and they, and they were talking about you know, recruitment and can't find people with straight skills. So look, recruit for attitude. You can teach people skills. You can, mm. It's hard to teach them attitude. You know, if, if you get a person with a great attitude, then they will develop the skills. Yeah, because their attitude will make them, will make them do it. So one of the things that I really, um, I, I, I understood probably in my, in my 30s or thereabouts was that, Actually, if things don't go the way you want them to go, stop pointing the finger at other people. Stop blaming the economy, the, you know, the, the, those two hours in the month, or the other person did do so-and-so, or this boss wouldn't do so-and-so, or you know, these conditions weren't right. Uh, what I learned was, if something goes wrong, start by looking in the mirror and just saying, what was my part in this? Love and I've done that all my life, and I still do that now. If something goes wrong, uh, my, my my first protocol is saying, what's my part in this? I go look in the mirror and I say, okay, what did or didn't I do that actually helped to make what I don't want to see happening happen? And I can't think of many situations where 80% of the of, of the of the, the responsibility hasn't lain with me. Uh, okay, others will have responsibility, but very often because you know my in my role, you know, I'm able to influence and lead and guide other people. So I do day in day out. So when, when things don't work out, I'll, you know, I say, okay, what's my part in this? And it's usually something I have or haven't done. And the person's part in it is usually caused by the thing that I actually have or haven't done. Yes. So and, so actually understanding that taking personal responsibility. Yes. You, know, you can't lie on your deathbed and say, well, look, I'd have had a better life if it wasn't for that rotten boss and all that rubbish weather we had and the, you know, the challenges over independence and you know and all the all the tough breaks i had in my life life would have been great otherwise yes you know, it's, your life, it's, it's your life it's your career you know it's up to you to make the most of it and you know if it if, if it goes badly then look in the mirror um so you, you know we are responsible for for our lives we're responsible for what happens in our in our lives that's profoundly simple, but not simplistic and extremely sage-like yeah. and wise. It's a bit carpe diem right there. Have a good look at yourself in the mirror. Yeah. Th th there's a quote that, that resonates, I've discovered recently, which is the difference between what you want and what you get is what you do. Exactly right. And um, I love that carpe diem sense of my own personal accountability to what's happening. Don't yes. blame the world. That Take responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And so many folk just, you know, the, 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 we... we I guess we we can live in a nanny state where you know if something goes wrong the state will look after me if I get sick the the, the hospital will get me well no we're responsible for our, our well being we're responsible for our for our health physical and mental health yes and uh, you know and take that responsibility and you'll have a much happier life and it's all about the choices that we make absolutely exactly right that's all that's all we can choose is how we choose to behave and how we choose to respond to what happens to us 
So I'm loving all of your formative experiences so far. They're actually embedding a different value and core belief, which is just lovely stuff. So it's alchemy and gold already, which we're coming on to. So back to you in the tree shaking. Yeah, I guess the other thing, it was almost it was a realisation that probably shaped what I've done, you know, for the past you know, 30 odd years. And that was actually understanding that I appeared to have a talent for inspiring and motivating people to do the things that they really should be doing to get where they want to get to. And uh, and that's why I guess, you know, I started the business back in the early 90s because I really, really wanted to help people make the most of themselves, um, you know, to, 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 to cut through a lot of the crap that, that flies around and to empower people to, to make things happen for themselves. Um, so yeah, I guess that was the... That was the the big realization that actually shaped what I've done over the past, you know, pretty much 30, 30 years now. Yes, and it's so profound that you've you've directly experienced the adversity that you're there to help with. So there's a there's a real mentality of I've been there. This isn't our first rodeo. I've been on that horse. I know what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, you, I, and your I mean, your beautiful honesty as well. Sorry, to, the, the honesty you had in the, in the last year, you too went back to that place of oh, yeah. what do I need to do to change because the world yeah. has changed. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've made every mistake known to man and some that are not yet known to man. <laughs> and by yeah. way, that's one of the things that most, most drew me to you when you first got in touch was the fact that you too were experiencing adversity in the pandemic as I was as a sort yeah. of a supplier, facilitator, coach, that sort of thing. Yeah. But you you, yeah. know, you, you have been, you know, I, I, anyone listening, you should get in touch with Colin McGill. This is fantastic stuff that you, you, I, you, you I, live I just it. love I love change. Change excites me. The future excites me, you know, and, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. And actually, I'm probably as 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 open to uh, and drawn by change as I ever have been in my life. And, you know, I just think that the ability to constantly adapt and constantly cha change ourselves to suit our, suit our environment, I think, is, is one of life's most important skills. I, I would argue that the ability to change is probably, for organisations, one of the most critical skills and capabilities, um, and as human beings, I think it's true true of us as well. Was it, I, I, was it recently? I was uh, I attended a webinar run by one of the banks, and they were saying that the pandemic has has increased the pace of um, of, of online of online use by something at like six six years. The, the use of the move towards being a cashless society has accelerated by something at like ten years in yes. one year. You know, so we, we we've never seen as much change as we as we have over the past the past year, and and the year the year so ahead is going to be enormous. The, the world's changing; we've got to respond to it. And then, ironically, at the, at its core, there's a really interesting quote, which is the only human beings that actively look forward to change are wet babies. The rest of us find it much, much, much more difficult. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. The pace of change and you know, change is absolutely inevitable. You know, we have to adapt absolutely. Yeah. That, right. Yeah. No. No. Um, yeah. I. I. I love. I love change. You know, I get really bored with things being the same as they've always been. So yeah. Let's just. Yeah. I, yeah okay. Uh, um. I, I'm. Yeah. I'm talking my professional life. I don't always apply that principle in my private life. So you, I can be pretty laid back in my private life, but very impatient and very, you know, and very driven in my business life. But quite, I can be quite the reverse in my private life. Probably well, because I'm so back at the end of that. <laughs> Uh, do you know what? That's very relatable. There's a maxim in our family, which is patience is a virtue daddy doesn't have. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I find that very relatable. Uh, it may surprise our listeners, Colin McGill and me, Chris Grimes, we're not perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm extremely imperfect, um, but I, I'm aware of my imperfections and, um, you know, they frustrate me and I do my very best to, to fix them. And actually, interesting, I, I, I set something out called Project, Project Colin. And um, there's things in, in my life that um, I've recognised are not going well. So I've made me a project. So I'm working on a whole bunch of stuff just now. I'm calling it Project Colin. And it's a delight, <laughs> to, it's a delight to be here helping you with Project Colin. So I really wanted Thank to you. give you this moment in your sunshine because you've been... <laughs> but sincerely, you've been very, very helpful to me. Uh, anyway, let, we're back to your tree. I think yeah. we're on to the three things that, have, um, that inspire you now. Yeah, I mean, interesting... Um, Tough, tough challenges, I think, always inspire me. You know, usually tough professional challenges always inspire me. Um, you know, I, I remember the first time I was asked to go and do some work in, in China for a company and in South Africa and stuff like that, and, and, and being faced with, and they were both very tricky challenges. And 
and these these things really excited and, and really inspired me and I mean, I probably had more adrenaline flowing at these times than anything else. Just, just, just professional challenges that say, wow, how in the hell am I going to do that? And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but, you know, I know I'll get there. So, you know, how am I going to do it? And, and, and these, these things really, really get my juices going. And, you know, I just love these, these really tough professional challenges to help fix things that are not working for, for people and organizations and, and help them get to, you know, get to a better place where they can, where they can, they, 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 they can create what they're trying to create and, so you're a real you're a real serial fixer and your 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 ability to turn up one of my favorite leadership quotes is leadership is how you turn up every single day <laughs> colin's going to yeah. be there because of your own volition you said you will make sure you're if you say you're going to be there you'll turn no up and you'll fix it yeah i, I, I remember yeah, the first time i went to south africa i, I was i was i was running a, a workshop at um one o'clock in the day and um there was all kinds of you know, problems and hassles. I might be the night before. All kinds of problems and hassles to get there. And I got there. I actually arrived in the building in Johannesburg at five at five past one with the group waiting for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it went fantastically well. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's turning up and then saying. And I guess one thing that it, it also taught me to do uh, was to be a good a good winger. Um, <laughs> so I've learned over the years. You know, I, I, I remember someone saying to a comedian, you're so spontaneous. The person says, it takes years of practice to become spontaneous. <laughs> that is indeed I, I've, true. I've, I've had years of, of, of screwing up and what have you. And I've learned, I've learned to, to wing it and be spontaneous and, and make it up as I go along. <laughs> I'm loving the image of being a winger and chipping it in. On the head, Colin McGill, on the head, back of the net. We love that. <laughs> It might, it might often it often bite me in the bum, but yeah, that's another matter. <laughs> Love that mud on the bum is okay. It means you've been in there having a good old, which is wonderful. Great stuff. So we're still there in in the inspirational stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. Another thing is, is um, I, I can be really moved and I can I can quite emotional and re really inspired by great sporting achievements. You know, I remember I'm a, I'm a massive golf you know golf golf fiend and and fan, and I, I remember you know that the you know the, the the first time you know the Britain and, and Europe won the um, the Ryder Cup of, you know, from the Americans, and I remember I was watching a pub at the time, and I remember myself literally you know, dancing about the place, punching the air. And so was everybody <laughs> else in the, in the room, but I can be so inspired by you know by by by, by great against the odds achievements. I can I can watch something where a, a person who is in some disadvantage achieves something amazing, and I can be wow, this is incredible. I can be almost brought to tears by it, and. Yeah, I just find I just find you know people achieving things, and and I, I still see it you know in my professional life where someone said, "Wow, how did you manage that? That's amazing. Well done, you! Wow!" I just get such an inspiration. From it, the ebullience and enthusiasm that you constantly bring to the surface is like a sort of geezer or a groundswell. <laughs> it's a spring of <laughs> spring of energy and enthusiasm and passion and connection. Well, it, it is because it's a wonder what you know. I've got you know my, my, my you know I, I'm allowed to do amazing things with with people and uh, and to given such access and such freedom and such openness and such honesty with people and it's just sometimes i just think sometimes i'm having a what i think wow i'm so i'm incredibly fortunate you know how in the hell do i manage to do these things and get people to allow me to invite me in to do the things that you know i'm able to to help them do so i find that so so inspiring another thing is live music um you know, I, I haven't been to too many concerts over the years. I went to quite a lot when I was younger, but over a few years, my, my son and I have gone to, you know, we, we've we tried to go to a concert, you know, every year, but we haven't done it, obviously, for the past, two, you know, past 18 months. But we went to see Coldplay. I've been a great Coldplay fan for, wow. you, know, um, uh, you know, for as long as I've been around. And we went to uh, to watch Coldplay at Hampden Park. It was a big open. There was, there was 40,000 folk. And I'm doing, I'm doing the sums 40,000 times. I thought, wow, there's a lot of money in this. <laughs> wow, yes. You 100 quid, you know, 40,000 folk, 300 pounds. Wow. You're in the wrong business. Anyway, it, it was it was the most beautiful night you can imagine. It was about, you know, half past eight, still about, about 70 degrees, beautiful, you know, beautiful sunset. And and the music was incredible, and I thought, "Wow, this is just you know." And I, I was bouncing at the end of it. I just, I get really inspired by you know by by watching live music of of of, 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 of somebody that I like, a band that I like, or somebody that I like. And I'm a big it, Coldplay and Chris Martin fan myself, so I uh -huh, yeah, I just, it just, I just, it just, it gives me such a buzz. And even Ironically, just playing it, 
And ironically, they were the first band to go public saying we can't tour anymore because of the sort of carbon footprint. Ah, and yeah. then the pandemic yeah. happened. Yeah. So there is that sense of, oh, be careful what you wish for. Know, um, because of course everyone's gagging to get back into the <laughs> arena again of live music. <laughs> and, and, and something I do on, on a Saturday morning is, is um, I'll have breakfast and have a, you have a, have a, have a have my daily workout. And then uh, I'll stick around some headphones. And I, I put on Mr. Brightside <laughs> from the Wonderful. Killers, and and I would jump about the room like a mad thing. My wife doesn't know I do this because she's up and still up in bed at that time, and I'm I'm, I'm prancing about like a, an 18 year old playing Mr. Brightside and and um, <laughs> things like that. A lovely image for us all to conjure. Yeah, I love I know, that. Yeah, not, not a pretty sight, but you no, know, I think live music really, really inspires and you know en- energizes, excites me. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess these are the three things that really you know that really really inspire and excite me. Okay, two things that never fail to hoop squirrels get your attention, Colin McGill. Um, golf courses. I, I play golf since I was eight. I used to go in and um, and walk around with my dad. My dad was a very good player, and I used to, you know, and I remember him buying me um, my my first golf club. It was a, a wooden club that he, he cut down to size. He, he bought it. At the, at the, you probably heard of the Barrows. It's, it's a famous, yeah, the, the Barrows in Glasgow. Yeah. Um, you know, a, fa- a famous you know market, and he got me this golf club, and and ever since eight, you know, I've been hooked on golf, and it drives me bloody crazy. I have to say, it's the most frustrating, annoying, uh, inspiring, energizing sport, and it's 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 like life. It's full of the most incredible highs and the most <laughs> the most terrible lows. It's, it's a great metaphor for life in many ways. And, <laughs> and you know, anytime I'm you know I, I'm if I'm driving by some place. I'll spot a bunker. I'll see, I'll see a golf course or something on television. It's countryside, and I'll, I'll be looking at it. Oh, that looks like a bunker. I'm just drawn <laughs> towards it with golf. I have a fixation about it. Um, it, it, it um, you know, was it, you know, was it said that, that men think of it sex every, every every five every five every five minutes, something like that. And um, I think about golf courses every five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I love and, that. And, and, yeah, and the former as well. <laughs> That's another matter. <laughs> and if it can happen in the bunker, all the better. Lovely. <laughs> as long as you don't stand on the rake, obviously. No, no, no I think my, one of my best friends, my, my best friend, I think maybe probably he had that experience one time he told me. <laughs> <laughs> but like, off air, I can tell you my favourite golf joke, which you don't know that I know, but I'll tell you off air later on. Wonderful. <laughs> um, wonderful. Thank you. And now uh, we're into either the second thing. Second thing is... I guess it's, it's family. It, it's it's things that I'll never fail to grab my attention. Are things like things my you know my, my family. You know, my, my son's doing well in his career, so if he gets a promotion or things would go really well, that really it really gets my attention, inspires me. Um, you know, my, my 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 grandson. He went to school, and we're concerned about oh, you know you know because because when my son went to school, you know it wasn't great. It, it wasn't great the first 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 few while, um, but then uh, when Aaron went to school. He settled in fantastically well, and he started to get you know top pupil on a regular basis, and that really you know gave me a real buzz, and you know that spotted that really. And my wife, she's she's very very involved. She's she's trustee of a few things in the village, and she's on about three or four committees. And she's somebody once said, uh, "This is Ivy, and she runs she runs Torrance. <laughs> <laughs> she runs well, everything. So always think, yeah, she she's very community spirited, and she's always doing things that really. I keep on saying, this is your work. She hasn't worked for a long time. I said, but this is your work. I don't, I don't work. She does a day a week in charity shop. But I said, this is your work. You know, it really it, 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 it engrosses and engages you the same way as, as my work does me. And yes. so, you know, I'm always, you know, always, I'm always, always interested in, and uh, my attention is drawn to things that she's achieving and things that she pushes forward. So, um, see, I guess these are the things that never fail to, to grab my, my attention. There's the there's so much the currency and the elixir of energy throughout your interpretation of this exercise, which is so lovely. Okay, now one quirky or unusual fact about you, Colin McGill, we couldn't possibly know. Until oh, right. Okay. Um, can, can can I give you two? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. W- one was um, I left school at fifteen without any qualifications. <sighs> wow. And um, and I, I suppose it was. I suppose it's it's always been trying to prove myself because of, of you know that confidence element that not being well educated, you know I think I'm I'm a pretty smart guy, but uh, you know I'm not academically. Although I, I was doing very well academically, uh, and then you know I just fell out of love with school and hated the, the whole environment. Um, 
So I, I guess that was always a bit of a, a dragging anchor. So but I, I guess what it, it's, and, you know, I'm not alone in that. You know, there are many other people who've been successful that have done, you know, massively more so than I have been, uh, that have come from a very, a very modest, you know, educational background. So I, I guess what, what, what it's taught me is that, and I see it, I see it a lot, is that you know, there, there, there's so many incredibly educated folk who don't make a lot of their of their lives either professionally or personally, um, and there's a, you know, a lot of, of people who are very ill-educated who actually yes. go on to achieve really good things. So you've made uh, so, me, you remind me of David Bowie, who apparently left with an, two O levels, one in woodwork and one in art. That's all you need. <laughs> And so you have that, that so yeah. but, but in all seriousness it's about emotional intelligence anyway that's going to be the, the, that's going to equip you far better absolutely right that's absolutely right and, and it's that personal drive that personal energy that that, that desire and, and that i think it's that it's that having that mission i think having a mission in life is so so important and purpose yes uh, and a, a purpose and i don't actually think about it in these terms a lot of the time but yeah but i guess i think you know it's, it, everything i do has been very much mission and purpose driven if you like Lovely. And I probably had that. Probably had that from a reasonably. Well, no, it probably wasn't that active, and you know, in, until maybe my late twenties, I would think it really, it really blossomed at that point in time. By the way, what, realized, I, help. what I've just heard there is you're you're all about mission possible rather than mission impossible. Exactly right. This I, can I, be done. I, I, I live in the future. I, I live a lot in the future. My, my, I'm very future focused, and that sometimes can be a challenge. Um, but yeah, so yeah, sometimes I'm not always in the present. But I'm actually working part of project call is to be in the present. Whatever I'm doing now, do it. Let's do it well. If I'm if I'm with if I'm with my wife or doing some, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it now. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting better at it because my, my mind is always flitting to the future and stuff like that. What could be, what's possible? What could be done? So let's bring you into the as you are being very present here in the clearing. We've shaken yeah. your tree. Um, yeah. We've got to get a slight lick on now because this is a really wonderfully rich, full of alchemy and gold conversation. Anyway, we're going to right. move away from the tree now and talk about alchemy yeah. and gold. When you are at yeah. purpose and in flow, Colin yeah. McGill, what do you most like to bring to the world? Um, I, I, I like to help people work out solutions for themselves. I, 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 you know, what, what I know about what most of my clients do, you could write in the, the back of a small postage stamp. Um, but what I, what I love doing is actually helping people figure out the solutions to their own problems or figure out sources to get to where they want to get to. Because 99 tenths of 100, you, you, cause you knew, you know, what you, you knew what you had to do. <laughs> All I did was I, I brought some, some new thinking, some new tools, some new approaches. And, and it helps you figure things out for yourself. And I see that when I'm in full flow, I just love to work with a group and have the group say, right, we know what we're doing now. Okay, 20 weeks after you, we'll do, 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 hey, let's get going tomorrow. And I, I just love to, 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 to work with, with individuals and groups of people to help them just get to that aha moment, right, we know what to do. We know what the way forward looks like. And let's go do it. And I just love seeing people going at this like a bullet at gates and, and making things happen. One of our mantras is making things happen in days and weeks, not not weeks, months, and years, and or never. Sometimes things just never change. So we want to make I want to make change happen in weeks, days and weeks that that sometimes will never change if it's not for our input, yeah. or it might take forever, a long, long time, you know, with, without it as well. You've got the perfect, perfect name for your business, by the way, in what you've just described, Turbo Change Limited. It's get it there quickly it with the is. wonderful optimism and energy that you bring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, but thank you. But that, that's I, I love, I love, I love doing that. I just love, I love the the privilege of being able to work with people and, and and help them get to that that great place. Lovely answer. I just wanted a little silence to hang in the air there as we go. <laughs> yeah, Colin McGill, he's awesome. We're going to award you with a cake now, Colin McGill. This is for gracing us with your presence here in the Good Listening To show, Clearing. And you can get to put a cherry on the cake now. This is a multi-layered cake, open to interpretation. It could be the best piece of advice you've ever been given. Going back to your Scoutmaster, you may have covered that. Could be something different. Uh, it could be um, inspired by Shakespeare and all the world's a stage. How would you most like to be remembered? What would like, you like your legacy to be? But it's over to you as to what you'd like the legacy of this conversation to be with your time here um, in light of the clearing. I, 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 I would, I would just, I mean, I, I'm very motivated to, you know, I don't really care what people think about me, what I do. 
Um, you know, it's not quite true, but you know, it, it is not high in my. I, I used to be very sensitive to what other people thought. I think as you get older, you become um, less concerned about that, perhaps. Uh, but what I, I'm concerned about is 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 is, is what is what people do. So my, I think my, one of my big legacy would be that is the knowledge that that I've really helped a lot a lot of people get what they want to get, uh, become happier, more fulfilled, and more successful in whatever their endeavours are. And if they, if they think of me, then they think of me as being, you know, as somebody who acted with integrity and somebody who actually was influential in helping them get where they wanted to wanted to get to. And um, and I think if, if, if I was to be remembered, then that's how I, I think I would like to be remembered. And, uh, you know, and, and above all else, you know, I'd like to be remembered as a, you know, as a, a loving, caring, you know, father, um, you know, a husband and, and, and grandfather and friend. Again, part of Project Colin is that sometimes I get so engrossed in my work that um, these other really, really, really important people in life actually don't get my attention. So, so one of my one of my big focus just now in Project Colin is to is to start to pay more attention to the folk that in my life are really important to me that yeah I, I give scant attention to sometimes. I think anyone listening, Colin, sincerely, is just going to overwrite their own name to their own project because it's such an inspirational thing to do. I'm thinking Project Chris in what you're saying about Project Colin. So that's yeah. so alchemically golden and awesome. And <laughs> what a great legacy. <laughs> Where can we find out more about Colin McGill on the Internet? And this is an invitation to go as deep as you like, as hard as you like on your URLs, Vicar. So go where you want. Yeah, well, it, the email address is, is colin.mcgill at turbo, that's T-U-R-B-O change.co.uk um that's probably the best the, the best place to get to get contact uh, the website is turbo, turbochange.co.uk so you can visit either of these two areas there i was going, I was going to mention just one, one, one final thing you know a couple of quotes that that um that i was going to mention to you uh that i think i mentioned i think it's useful to for me to understand all the time and hopefully those who are listening just now to understand nothing changes until you do Nothing changes until you do. You know, I think, it's, if, if, I think as, as, as human beings, if we get that message, understand that, internalize that and say that, you know, things, this is not working well for me. This is not going well. That's not going well. We can't, we can't change some of the stuff. We can't change other people. But if we change ourselves, other people will respond automatically different to us. And I think if there's one big message is nothing changes until you do. If you want things to be different, Nothing will change until we do. And, and a mantra my wife always comes up with, uh, in fact, she says this many years ago, she says, you die if you worry, you die if you don't. <laughs> now, she's a bit of a worrier. I keep on reminding her of that. But actually, so, so many people just now are worried about the future and, and uh, agonise over, over things. And it doesn't actually get, all, all it does is make us feel crap. You die if you worry. You die if you don't. And just reincorporate that lovely quote that you said before that about change. Nothing changes until you do. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the wonderful, warm, just gorgeous man that is Colin McGill. I'm, I'm so happy to know you, Colin. I've been Chris Grimes. This has been The Good Listening To Show. Do tune in next week for more stories in the clearing. Thank you very much indeed. And good night. <laughs>